NFL linebacker for the New Orleans Saints, Demario Davis, discusses his career, his faith, and an issue near to his heart. And later, we bring you the inspiring story of a pro-life witness in the African-American community. And Sharon Robinson, daughter of baseball legend Jackie Robinson, shares stories about her dad and growing up during the civil rights movement. The World Over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. As Black History Month draws to a close here in the U.S., Demario Davis, Pastor Walter Hoy, Sharon Robinson, and Devon Franklin are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. I'll be live tweeting. Throughout. My first guest is a star linebacker with the New Orleans Saints. At six foot two, 250 pounds, he's a fearsome presence on the gridiron. But there's much more to his story than what you see on the field. I spoke to him last year at CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Committee here in D.C., and we talked about his career, his faith, and the work he's enacted on behalf of criminal justice reform. Here's my interview with Demario Davis. <laughs> Now, I have a confession to make before we start. Here at CPAC, you know, they don't let you wear, they don't like you to wear T-shirts, but if I were going to wear a T-shirt, <laughs> this is the one I was going to wear. <laughs> I am a proud member of the Houdat Nation. Houdat, so Houdat. to have Demario here, just so you know, Demario Davis, this last season, and I was in the Superdome for a lot of these games, he had the number one tackling record in the NFL. More sacks, more unbelievable, more than 100 tackles. An incredible player. But he's so much more than that. And today we want to talk about really one of the passions of your life, Demario, which is criminal justice reform. Mm. Tell people a little bit about your story. When you were in 10th grade, something happened. Mm -hmm. What happened? Uh, well, it was where I lived at. My mom had me when she was uh, 16 years old. And so. Um, the environment that I grew up in was filled with uh, drugs, gangs, uh, clubs, mm. and I got involved in a lot of that. And by the time I got to college, and though I had a scholarship, my first year in college, I was arrested and went to jail for uh, shoplifting and stealing groceries out of Walmart. Mm. And when I went to jail, I realized that I had a $10,000 bond, and I didn't have $10,000 to pay, wow. so I didn't know what was going to happen, but my coach paid pay my way and um, I was able to uh, get out of jail uh, because and not spend that time you know pre-trial leading up to my court date in jail mm -hmm. and then when I got to the league and started to spend time in the criminal justice reform space and realized that people are going to jail um, simply because they can't pay the bill and they're spending mm -hmm. seven eight months in jail sometimes years in jail without even having a court date because the system is so backed up mm. i realized that i easily could have been a statistic right and my coach has not stepped in and paid that i couldn't pay the bill my mom couldn't pay it mm. we didn't have that type of money but because i was an athlete i was able to not go to jail give people a sense uh, you know pe we, we all think well this doesn't affect me pre-trial incarceration that couldn't affect me at all i was stunned when i started doing research on this you have rapists, you have child molesters, you have murderers who are set free in the pretrial period, but people who shoplift, uh, engage in nonviolent crimes, they are often incarcerated, sometimes for a month awaiting trial or more. What's the cost to us as a people, financially and otherwise? Well, you got to realize uh, it's going to fix uh, the taxpayers uh, tremendously. I'll give you a story about a grandmother in San Antonio who stole $105 worth of clothes to put clothes on the back of her grandkids, mm. um, was arrested, and spent three months, months in jail because she had a $150,000 bond that she could not pay. Mm. Um, you think about how that's going to affect those children uh, tremendously. So for that crime, because she couldn't pay it, she spent three months in jail, but you just talked about the serious crimes, far more serious mm. than that, who people are able to get out of jail immediately because they have the funds to, uh, mm -hmm. to get out. But that grandmother spending that time cost the uh, taxpayers on average uh, $3,000, mm -hmm. additional $3,000. For pre-trial last year, um, 
we paid $13.6 billion in taxes to for the pretrial because they're 40 percent of our nation that's locked up. The most incarcerated country in the world is pretrial, and nine out of ten of those people who are in jail pretrial are because of cash bill. I, I was stunned when I, I, I learned just this week, because I, I, I do a lot of work, as, as J, J, Mario does, with illiteracy, with children. Do you know what costs in California? A hundred, almost $130,000 per inmate per year to incarcerate them. For juveniles, it jumps up to more than $180,000. That comes out of our tax dollars annually. And that's just one person. One person. What is the answer here? I know the American Conservative Union has been supporting something like uh, these freedom, you know, uh, uh, bail organizations that would be community-based. So that, uh, t let's back up a moment. Tell people about the financial incentives that are at play in the system today to actually jail people and the bail lobbyists. Tell us about that and the effect it has. Well, yeah, to speak a little bit to both of what you said, um, number one, you got to think about the school to prison pipeline. Um, so they're going into the schools and looking at the fourth grade reading level and deciding just how many prisons we want to build based on this reading, the, the reading level of the fourth graders. So at the same time, they could actually, for me to send my child to a private school, one of the best private schools, is going to be about $20,000 a year. Right. So you're thinking about $180,000 to hold somebody in prison versus $20,000 to just build a school um, that was big enough to, to facilitate these children and enhance the reading level, which you would think would be the, the right thing to do, right? Yeah. Sounds too much, it makes too much sense. All right. um, but when you talk about the, the bail system, um, when we go and fight these legislative bills in California and New York, um, speaking of that, there's, there's a bill trying to get passed right now that the legislators are, are trying to figure out they want to do criminal justice reform around cash bail. Yeah. The people who are fighting against this are the bail sponsors. Hmm. and the prosecutors, the people who benefit from sending people to jail. We have a user-paid friendly, uh, user-friendly system in um, New Orleans where the judge, the prosecutor, and the defender are all incentivized to send people to jail. They all get paid based on how many people are in jail. Hmm. How, does that, how is that going to affect the person that's, that's standing before the judge? Yeah. Nobody here is not, <laughs> has a reason not to send this person to jail. Yeah. Actually, they make more money by this person going to jail. So that makes the defender less likely to defend them, the judge less likely to set, declare innocent, and the prosecutor to ask for the harshest punishment. Hmm. And the taxpayer is left with the bill. Exactly. In perpetuity. I mean, the other problem here is the human capital lost. I mean, we have the innovation, the intensity, the creativity of individuals who aren't given a second chance. And again, we're talking about nonviolent offenders here. Um, what are you hearing? What, it, there seems to be a movement. We saw President Trump move a criminal justice reform bill this past year, something that has not been done. Uh, administration after administration promised it. Congress after Congress promised it. There, this first step, which is what it's called, moved forward this past year. Your thoughts on what that means. There seems to be a consensus on right and left that we have to do something about criminal justice. I think the, I think the um, momentum is starting to, to move in the right direction. I think there are uh, great ideas to be able to replicate. You look at D.C., it does have a no-cash mm -hmm. bail system. The crime is uh, definitely not higher here than anywhere else. I mean, you think the justice system is designed to make our community safer. Um, you look at Philadelphia. Apia was a... Uh, um, printed today in the USA Today talking about Larry Krasner and what he's doing as a prosecutor in Philadelphia. Um, 25 cases where he chose to do no cash bail. And that's about 61% of the cases that, were, that came to uh, Philadelphia. And, mm -hmm. and these were nonviolent offenses, including drug offenses and prostitution. And actually, the violent crimes decreased by 5% in 2018. Huh. And, and uh, the crime rate did not go up. There was another study, and this is, this is fascinating, that I came across just in my own research. What happens to a nonviolent offender when you hold them pre-trial, okay? When you incarcerate them for a day, two days, three days. Here's what they found. Two to three days incarceration, they're 39% more likely to be charged with another crime. You keep them from four to seven days, again, in a pre-trial incarceration they're 50% more likely to be arrested a second time. What does that tell you, and what can be done about this? That's, that's a tremendous tragedy, and I would even uh, up that even more. Really? The death, the death rate uh, goes up in jail, and are more likely for our pretrial people. A third of the people um, that die in jail die within the first week. Um, really? Also, um, three quarters 
uh, the deaths that happen in our country in jail or pretrial um, or our pretrial inmates. Hmm. So it's, it's almost like a death sentence to send somebody to jail for that long, that, that extent of period of time um, without them being convicted of uh, being innocent or guilty. And we're literally talking about millions and millions and millions of dollars in pretrial incarceration. We're not talking about not penalizing people who are guilty of heinous crimes. That's not what we're talking about here. But that pretrial period, if you're dealing with a non violent offender, is it worth it? In Cuyahoga County in, in Ohio, just Cuyahoga, $42 million they spent last year. We've spent $13 billion nationally incarcerating people pre-trial. What do you suggest? What should be the legislative step? What are you asking people to do to reform this bail and, and pre-trial incarceration area? I think it looks different a little bit everywhere, but ultimately we should be trying to move away from uh, cash bail as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. If we feel like somebody's gonna be a threat to society, don't recommend bail. So for those people who are, we do have violent, very violent offenders, mm -hmm. and people who are very scary, who need to be locked up, just simply uh, ask that they don't, have, they don't have bail. But for our non-violent offenders, uh, you're pretty much making it a, a profit-based system. You know, it's mm -hmm. all about do you have the money or do you not have the money that depends on if you're gonna go, if you're gonna stay mm -hmm. in jail or not. Also, the bail system is designed to incentivize people to come back. What we've looked, found out statistically is uh, people who uh, get out of jail on cash bail are 94% with no cash bail um, are 94% um, likely to return to court. The, the, other, the other thing I think a lot of people miss because you know, either they don't see it in their own family or they haven't heard the stories. When you take someone and incarcerate them, particularly if it's a head of a household, the, grand, the sole grandmother who's raising children, what impact does that have on the family? I mean, you yourself, your father was a vet. He was away serving mm -hmm. in the Middle East. And did that, do you think that caused you to turn to mentors who were perhaps not the best mentors <laughs> at the time? And do you see a pattern of that? Oh, all the time. If you look in the communities where we raised, uh, a lot of the men are not in the household, household for various reasons. So the young boys, I believe very much so that it takes a man to teach a man uh, teach a boy how to be a man, and when they're not around, the boys are just going to look to the older guys, the older guys in society, and um, the older guys in, in, in our society who were drug dealers, gang bangers, and whatnot, and so that's kind of who we, we followed and tried to emulate, and that's what took us down a bad path. Mm -hmm. So we have to think about that we're ma actually making our communities less safer when we take people and lock them up for that extent of time. Um, for nonviolent offenses because they're gonna be gone from their family. Mm -hmm. um, it's, gonna, it's gonna drastically push them into even more poverty because um, if my mom, had I not had a, uh, a coach, my mom would have tried everything she could to get me out of jail on bail, which would have forced her to go to a bail bondman who would have made her put her house up, maybe put a car up, mm -hmm. and just kind of locked her into some type of slave, slave type system, something that she couldn't pay back. And when she couldn't pay back, she was indebted to the bail bondman, which would have pushed her into even more poverty. Yeah. We've got to do something about this, yeah. this bail system. It's not, but again, the bail bond lobbyists, are, every time the reform moves forward, they sort of seize in. Oh, but yeah. it's not good for us as a people. It's not good for the, for the community. It's certainly not good for children. I want to talk for a moment about your devoted Dreamers Foundation. Um, tell people a little bit about, in your personal life, you, you, when you, you come out of prison, you're at the, um, well, you weren't there for long, but yeah. you, were, you were caught up in the system. You come out. You're at Arkansas State. You meet a pastor there who really changed your life. Yes, very much so. Tell me what happened there. So I had the opportunity to be a uh, disciple by our team chaplain. And a little bit after that, when I was in jail for the three days that I was in there, I just started to really wrestle and understand my life isn't going the direction I wanted to go. And he just started spending time with me day by day, asking questions about what I thought about life. And um, he introduced me to the Bible and um, started to teach me about a relationship with Christ. He walked me into a relationship with Christ, mm. and, it, and it changed my life uh, in the, per the perspective that I had of life tremendously. You know, no, no longer was my life about glorifying myself, mm. but it was about living a life worthy of yeah. glorifying the King. Um, and I watched him, and I watched how he, it was, it was amazing. My whole life I had never seen uh, a two-parent household and be led under God. And so I watched him and hmm. how he raised his family, and it, my, it, it inspired me to do the same. I've been married now seven years, three amazing kids, and they all raised in the household of Christ. And, um, yeah, it changed like tremendously. And so had I not, never got that second chance, my life could look totally different. But because I had that second chance, and that's the importance that we didn't make sure that we're doing with the rest of society, society instead of throwing people away and, lock, and locking away the key, mm -hmm. we need to be making sure we're trying our best to give them second chances because you never know what kind of positivity can yep. come out of that.
and connection. I love in your story, connections, mentorship. We can't give up on anybody. And one of the beautiful things, you know, I live in New Orleans, and if you have not seen this guy play, I was in the Superdome this last season. You all are going to the Super Bowl next year. I'm just saying it now. You heard it here first at CPAC, okay? At the end of every major play, Demario does something that you all perhaps have not seen. But watch closely next season, because I think you're going to see a lot of it. I mean, this guy led in tackles last season. He'll do it again. Show people what you do at the end of a major play. There's a gesture you do. Show it to them. I know yeah, well, it's a little it's very awkward simple. here. Tell well, a lot of times if you haven't seen it, what I'll do is after a sack or a big play or an interception, what I'll usually do is just go and when I find a camera, you'll see me do that. And it's a, it's a very simple pose, but a lot of, a lot of believers... Okay, I'll tell people what it means. A lot of people have seen that, you know, and a lot of believers would know what that means because they've seen that pose so much, but it's simply Jesus on the cross. And we're called as believers to be imitators of Christ, take up our cross daily. And that's just a representation that every big play is not for me, but it's about glory above. And so that's why I do it, to make sure that I'm glorifying the person um, who's responsible for saving my life and the Lord of my life. So. Okay. We only have a few, beautiful, I mean, it's an incredible witness. Um, I, I, in, our, in our final minutes, I've got to ask you, that I was in the dome during that Steelers game. There was a fumble at the end, near the end of the game. This guy recovers it and shut the Steelers down. Then you all go to the championship, and there was that missed call that every member of the Houdat Nation <laughs> is still, thank you, thank you, my people, we're all Houdat Nation today. The pain, and that was tough. That was a tough moment. The NFL, it seems, is not going to reform those misplays or allow any uh, replays or, or reviews. Is that a mistake? Um, I think a lot goes into it. You always have to be able to see both sides of it because, you know, that was a very unfortunate play that happened to us um, because we do feel like it changed the trajectory of it and uh, a trajectory of what could have happened next. Mm -hmm. um, but you do have to realize that a lot of games will be affected by the rule change, which it could ultimately uh, slow down the pace of the game. I get you know? it. So you do have to understand that there are two perspectives. Um, I think as far as what happened to us, it was a beautiful opportunity uh, for us to take a negative situation and turn it into a positive. You look at Drew Brees' response to the entire city about, hey, we're not going to be bitter about this. We're not going to be mm. uh, resentful. We're going to actually turn this negative into a positive. We're going to use it as fuel and motivation um, to come back next year. And I think that's what we have to be as a society. It's a lot of bad things happening around mm -hmm. us, but it's very easy to take a negative situation and turn it into a positive situation. Life is 10% what happened to you and 90% how you respond to it. I agree. Drew Brees and this team, they have such grace. And I have to tell you, um, I always think, I think I should write a book about this. The country could learn so much about not only race relations, but what it means to be civil in society if you spent a week in New Orleans. Now, look, we have crime, we have our difficulties, but nowhere do you see a community, and I think it's partly because People, they, you had nine separate races that came together, married, intermingled, shared recipes, our music. All of that is a bit of the gumbo that makes our city. Mm -hmm. When the Saints lost that championship game, the following, when they had the Super Bowl, they had a boycott in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So people took to the streets, hundreds of thousands of people, the whole city was out in black and gold. They had spontaneous parades, cookouts, community, black, white, Hispanic, everybody coming together. It was such a beautiful moment. It was better than the Super Bowl. <laughs> and all, that could only happen in New Orleans. I want you to tell people very quickly before we run out of time, tell me about your Devoted Dreamers Foundation that you founded and the MBA that you are pursuing now as an NFL player. Why did you make that decision to pursue your master's in business? Um, I think uh, one of my mentors just talk, talked about the degrees of separation and differentiation and understanding that, you know, we all can be on a level playing field, but if you just continue to climb up, you can dif differentiate yourself away from the pe around the people around you. Mm -hmm. And so that just was another reason and another goal to chase. Um, as long as you live, I think you should never stop chasing goals, never stop chasing new dreams. And that's what, you know, kind of leads into uh, Devoted Dreamers 
uh, foundation, which I have, and it's encouraging these kids who have these dreams that you can attain your dreams if you just believe and move towards them. And so what we have is a mentorship program. We have uh, various programs throughout. We have a seven-week summer camp where we uh, enhance kids spiritually, mentally, physically. We have gospel conferences where we take 250 kids in and just share the gospel with them and listen to worship music all day and try to teach them the gospel and mm -hmm. give them opportunity to come to Christ like I, like I did. Uh, when I leave here, I'll be going back to my 707 uh, travel elite team where it's a mentorship program. We focus on academia. We focus on uh, mentorship and dealing with peer pressure, drugs, alcohol, sex. And we also uh, have a chaplain like I had come in and speak to them and share the gospel on top of playing football. And our main message to them are you're not football players, you're influencers. Teaching them when they go in their classroom, they're an influencer. When they go to their friend's house and they go to parties, they're influencer. So understanding that you can influence society in a positive way, you can influence society in a negative way and take that stigma of just being an athlete first and a person second away from. Mm. What, what do you want? I love that. I love that you're giving back. That you're taking the time to give back. There are a lot of players who, there, look, there are a lot of players who do a lot of good like this. They have foundations. They reach out to the community. There are, there are others who could care less. I love that you're the former. What do you want people here to take away from before we leave that uh, from this criminal justice reform idea that you have and where you think the reform needs to take place, what do you want them to go back to their communities? I would just say this, when it comes to people, um, we remember people. We don't remember people for what they do. We remember people for what they did for us. Mm. And so when you measure somebody to whom much is given, much is required. So what, what you have, you have talent, you have treasure, you have resources, you have time. How you use those to help those around you is how people are going to remember you. Mm. And so as a nation, you have to think of our nation in the same way. What makes our nation great really is the idea of what we do for everyone not just what we do for ourselves. So as we become this great nation or are this great nation, if we don't take all those resources to make sure it's extended to everybody, we're not being great. That's what makes us great as people. That's what makes us great as a nation. You can find out more about Demario Davis's Devoted Dreamers Foundation at devoteddreamers.org. Go Saints 2020. Who'd have? Now, this is an extraordinary story. Robert Artigo is the author of Black and Pro-Life in America about Baptist pastor Walter Hoy's arrest and eventual incarceration for his pro-life outreach in the black community. I spoke to both men about the book, Pastor Hoy's experience behind bars, and the personal events that led him to be such a strong advocate for life. Here's my exclusive interview with Pastor Walter Hoy and Robert Artigo. Robert, I want to start with you. In your introduction to the book, uh, you say this story really is not about abortion um, and didn't have to be told from that perspective. What about Pastor Hoy's story drew you to tell it? It's an American story. It's about uh, American history. It's about the experience that he had in Oakland in the context of American history, the uh, unfortunate events surrounding uh, the uh, suppression of an entire population in this country, I think that uh, great, it was a great education for me, what I learned and discovered about Reconstruction. And mm -hmm. so I think that people would get lost in the, the subject matter if they just stuck to the idea of abortion and uh, didn't realize that what this is is an example of a continuing problem with race in this country that deals with really the tyranny of the majority. Now, uh, Pastor uh, Walter Hoy, you, your pro-life conviction really uh, was, was solidified when your son was born at 22 weeks. He weighed about two pounds. How did you get involved in the pro-life movement and uh, demonstrating in front of this abortion facility where the story really takes shape? Really, one day I got a call in my, my office, which was really quite hard to catch me there. And the plan was for a pastor a black pastor to stand outside of an abortion clinic. And they were thinking that it would be difficult for anybody to walk by a pastor, a deacon, a priest, an mm -hmm. elder, mm -hmm. someone they'd recognize in the pulpit and go on into the clinic without stopping to talk. And you know what? They were absolutely right. The women stopped and we talked. Mm -hmm. And Robert, you explain how the city of Oakland went to great lengths to pass this bubble law uh, and then they enforced it on, on the pastor. Uh, explain to viewers what the law uh, intended and, and what it delineated. 
Well, it, back in 2000, they had a similar bubble law. This was to, this was like a stay away kind of law that said within 100 feet of a, an abortion clinic, you can't be within eight feet of a person entering or a, a person associated with the clinic. Mm -hmm. But the a city council member at the time said, hey, we don't need that because we've got great laws on the books already in California and federal law to protect it. We don't need it. Mm -hmm. The first day Walter was out there on the sidewalk in front of this for-profit abortion clinic in Oakland. They called the city council member, they called that particular city council member and they said, hey, remember that bubble law? Let's get that thing going. And they mm. really fast-tracked it through the city council without any real serious questions. Meanwhile, they, uh, they demeaned Walter Hoy and the two elderly ladies that spent their time on the, uh, on the sidewalk there. Absolutely. They didn't seem to care at the time mm -hmm. that there were other people Not out there. But they definitely, it definitely bothered him that Walter Hoy was there and a black man in front of that, that clinic where black women were going in and having an abortions. Mm. So they, they passed the law, went through, and as soon as it was passed, within, I, I can't remember the exact amount of time, but I want to say three or four months of a few times of Walter being out there. Mind you, two hours per week, that was it, that Walter was out there. Mm -hmm. And then each week, there was some kind of plan to try to make sure that the police were out there to uh, to cite Walter, and finally it happened, mm. and that of course led to a trial, criminal trial. And Pastor Hoy, they, there was an eight there's an eight foot perimeter where you can't approach anyone appro uh, anyone uh, heading into the abortion clinic, and you had a sign, right? What was on the sign, and why were you ended? Why were you eventually jailed? My sign simply said, God loves you and your baby, let us help you. And that turned out to be the exact three questions I would get. Mm -hmm. the, the ladies would walk up to me and they would say, is it true that God loves me? And I say, yes. And they say, is it true that God loves me and my baby? And it was always her baby. It wasn't anything else. Mm -hmm. And I say, yes, God loves you. God loves your baby. And then she'd look at me straight in the eye and she said, well, if that's true, if it's true God loves me, if it's true God loves my baby, will you help me? And I did. It wasn't anything that she wanted that we couldn't take care of. Mm. Now, so they cite you for, for what, what was it, violating the bubble rule? Absolutely. And it was simply standing on a public sidewalk, holding a sign, passing out literature, mm -hmm. and having a conversation. Mm. And, and you get a sentence of 30 days, which you took in jail instead of the lesser community service sentence. Why, why did you take that? Well, let's get this straight. I was facing four years in jail. Mm. It boiled down to 30 days because we had videotape evidence mm. in court that my rights were being violated. And mm. so in order to keep from being completely embarrassed, the courtroom's packed, the media is everywhere. They see the videotape. They see just the opposite of what they expected to see. The judge says, okay, let's do 30 days. Hmm. And while you're in jail, you minister to men there, you fast, you, you start a prayer group. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me what your time in prison was like. And you, I know you had a special visitor uh, at the same time. Well, my time in jail was, was filled with witnessing. There were those that were up all day, and I would be counseling with them all day. And then there were those that were up all night, and so I was counseling all night. Essentially, I wasn't sleeping in jail. And yes, we had prayer at midnight like Paul and Silas. And I tell you, it was just an amazing time. We led so many of my brothers in, um, in jail to, to Christ. Uh, Bishop uh, Salvatore Cordelion, the Archbishop of uh, San Francisco, also visited you there. Uh, what was that relationship like? Has it grown? Oh, my goodness. Uh, he has become my, my dear, dear friend. It was a fantastic visit. Because of who he was at the time, he was bishop-elect. They actually led he and I to a, a, a a wing that wasn't being used and so we were alone and during that time during that time we had a very very deep very very special conversation hmm. Walter you write about abortion and the effects it has specifically on the black population in America you say that abortion is the biggest single negative force on black American growth deterrent to it uh, you give give the audience a sense of these numbers in 2015 there were an estimated 1 million 44,679 black American women who were pregnant, 621,000 plus of those resulted in births, 423,000 in abortion. That means 40% of those pregnancies ended in abortion. 
What impact has this had on the black community, and why don't we hear more from black leaders about this crisis? Well, well, let me tell you. I mean, even if we add to that the abortion industry's data, where Alan Gutmacher says there's 28 percent, and the CDC says there's 35 percent, even if we even if we consider the fact that we're only 12, 13 at the max, 14 percent of the population, and then you cut that in half, just just consider when we're down to seven. If you cut that in half, considering uh, 15 to 44. Oh my goodness, you're down to about three. And the impact is, is that we are now below replacement level. The total fertility rate replacement level is 2.1. We're now down to 1.8. And if we wow. don't stop, if we don't think about where we're going and we continue at the current rate that we are now in terms of abortion, by 2050, by 2050, we'll be looking at 1.3. And 1.3, Raymond, mm. is there reversibility? Unbelievable. Do you see this as, as, as uh, uh, is there a racist intent and edge in the way that the black community is oh. targeted? These abortion clinics are, are predominantly in the, 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 the black community all over America. Uh, there's no question about that. You can not only look at the location of the abortion clinics, but, but you, can, you can also see how the clinics are, are located in a specific area where it makes it really, really easy. And this is all throughout the country. And so I don't think there's any question that this is simply um, uh, targeting. Mm. I want to read something you wrote. Uh, you said, keeping the black American community smaller and less powerful reflects the racist, eugenic, and genocidal mindset behind the abortion policies advanced by Planned Parenthood and the Democratic Party under the guise of helping black Americans. If black lives matter, then the life of the human being inside the womb of his or her black mother matters too. How do you get that message out, given the polarization we're seeing in the media and elsewhere? Well, one thing we talk about is that God created life. And when I'm talking to black leadership, particularly black pastors, we can agree, biblically speaking, that God created life. Mm -hmm. And when we start talking about uh, who's human and, and who's not, it becomes painfully clear, particularly to black pastors, that really understand personhood and understand that at one point we weren't considered person. Mm -hmm. So when the discussion is around who's human and who's not mm -hmm. and who's a person or who's not, we all know where that discussion is going. And it becomes easier, it becomes clearer for me to get the point across that even that child inside the womb is a living, breathing person, a human being that deserves to be protected by love and by law. Well, Robert, thank you so much for your time and for the book. Pastor Hoy, thank you for being here. Uh, thank and the, you, the, and the, the book is uh, a gripping read, Black and Pro-Life <laughs> in America. Thank you both. Thank you, Raymond. She's the daughter of one of the greatest baseball players of all time, a legend. But that's only part of her story. Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball in 1947 when he played for the Brooklyn Dodgers. But later, he worked tirelessly for civil rights. Sharon Robinson turned 13 in 1963 at the height of the civil rights movement. She tells her story in Child of the Dream, a memoir of 1963. Here's my interview with Sharon Robinson. Sharon Robinson, thank you so much for being here. Now, not only are you the daughter of baseball legend and civil rights icon Jackie thank Robinson, you, you grew up in the thick of the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Now, what made you decide to write this memoir? It really concerns your coming of age in 1963. Why write it now? I wanted to tell the story of, of the 1963 Children's Crusade in Birmingham, Alabama. I wanted mm. to share that story with children. I've worked for the past 50 years on helping kids find their voice. So I've been trying to find different ways to work with them on finding voice and why voice is important. Mm. And uh, I just thought the Children's Crusade would be a, a way to do it. And then my editor helped me figure out the format, you know, and to t which voice to tell it in. And he felt right. that as a memoir, it would work best. And I, as of writing it, I, I had to agree with him. Yeah. Now, this book is geared toward uh, middle grade readers, eight, 8 to 12 and up. Um, and your experience in yes. that year, it was certainly critical. These teen years are hard enough without growing up the daughter of a superstar and a civil rights uh, activist. 
Let's get into the story a little bit. It's 1963. You're 13 years old when Alabama okay. Governor George Wallace made his infamous call for segregation. Where were you when that speech was delivered? And did you have a sense of what was happening at the time? I was in, we had, in, my, in our house, um, we had, I guess today you would call it a family room, but it was this room that was also our library. Mm -hmm. And that's where our, our television was, our family television. And we watched the six o'clock news together as a family. Unfortunately, my dad was not home, so normally he would be there to help me, guide me through these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But I had my mother and my grandmother. So I was watching it, the news on television and heard it. And I was frightened of war because um, my, my older brother was not doing well, and I, and I mm. worried that he was going to go in the Army, mm. uh, be drafted in the Army. So I, I was very focused on war in the Vietnam coming up. Um, when I heard this announcement, and it frightened me, and I thought it was like a declaration of war. Yeah. You write eloquently in the book about your struggle, really, with your own identity, what it meant to be an African-American, growing up in a mostly white suburb, beautiful Connecticut suburb. Uh, what was that journey like? And when did you arrive at a sense of who you truly were? I suppose all of us during those teen years, you're kind of finding your way and, and defining yourself. Absolutely. You know, it is a typical uh, journey. Um, for me, uh, it was, it began, was beginning like from 12 to 13, mm -hmm. where I'm beginning to question everything and try to figure it out. Um, the, the things that helped me was certainly my family and our family talks, mm -hmm. but also it was Jack and Jill, uh, which was a, a national organization for children, black children, and it, and it was part social and part leadership development. So that kind of gave me a place to go with my peers at a time when black and white kids in teenage years split off huh. um, and they didn't socialize together. We had been great friends when we were um, in elementary school, um, but, but now things were changing and I yeah. needed to find a group. And so that gave me a linkage to the black community. Yeah. You, you tell the story of listening to records with so your So really, but you know, it's, a, it's an ongoing... Pro Go ahead. I was just going to say, so it's an ongo it was an ongoing process. I wouldn't say I really... I didn't really come of age fully until I got to Howard University mm. because it was um, a historically black college and mm. everyone there was, you know, striving and, and great discussions and worldview. And so that really helped me carried over the edge yeah. you, you, into understanding who I was. You write in the book of listening to records with your friend Candy during these uh, early teen years, trying to figure out what it meant to be African American because you felt disconnected from the black community. Explain that experience. And what were you listening to? Well, Motown. It was Motown mm -hmm. Records. So Motown um, singers, performers, that, that gave us, because remember my, our radio stations also played white music, primarily. Mm -hmm. So this was, um, our little 45 record players was our access to black music um, and, the, and the performers that we were loving. And that's when we started having parties and, mm. you know, actually being able to play this music and dance to it. So mm. <laughs> it was a very important linkage. Talk about your father for a moment, Sharon. Um, obviously a baseball legend to the rest of us. Yes. He broke uh -huh. uh, racial barriers in Major League Baseball, ended segregation in the league. What do you remember most about him and his example? Was he simply dad, or were you aware of his stature and significance early on? Combination. You know, he, being dad was the most important. Mm -hmm. um, but I, and I was very much aware of his baseball years, but I didn't understand them. Huh. Um, so I, for example, I knew my dad played baseball. I was too young. Yeah. You know, I was seven. And, and when he retired, I was just turned seven. Mm. Um, so I knew he was a baseball player. We had a trophy room. I, you know, I had all kinds of, saw all the awards and the plaques and all of that. But um, it wasn't, I, I saw the, the Jackie Robinson story for the first time when I was in a day camp. And again, I was the only black kid in this camp, and I had no context ah. to that early entry into baseball. Wow. And the racism he, he experienced. And it made me at that point say, wait a minute, what does this mean about the world I'm living in? Mm. So, it, you know, and I, but I was too, back then we didn't talk so much about our personal stuff. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't even ask my parents when I got home, what does this mean? I just had to keep trying to understand it as the years went by. Huh. 
He, he was really, I mean, he made his name with his great athletic ability, breaking barriers, and then he, he became an activist. Is that the part of you that, is that the part of him that you most remember? Well, he was very engaged, he was in the media, he was, a, you know, he was, he was leading uh, and, and a part of a movement. Yeah, absolutely. So when my dad retired from Major League Baseball, and it was 1957, the civil rights movement was really heating up, and he put right into his contract that he was going to use, he needed time to travel and to support the movement. And um, Mr. At Ch he was working at Chalk Full Nuts, vice president of personnel, and that they agreed to this. So he started, but he was an activist going way back, uh, Raymond. I just think his, mm -hmm. when he's playing, uh, when he uh, was in the Army and it was court martial for refusing to move to the back of the bus in, mm -hmm. in Texas. So he had shown uh, activism in him all of his life, even when he was a kid and couldn't mm -hmm. figure out why they wouldn't let the black and brown kids swim in the public swimming pool. Mm -hmm. you know, so he was always thinking as an activist. Mm -hmm. And you know, even the integration of baseball was activism. And he just wanted to use that as leverage to help continue the change in the country. Mm -hmm. Give me a sense of... Uh, and that's I, who I knew. I mean, and, and wonderfully... Go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say that he, he, when he would travel south, he would come home and share stories with us. Mm. So I, it brought us into the larger movement, uh, even though we were, um, you know, doing something on a much smaller basis in our in our own community in Stanford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. You know, we, he tried to bring us in, allow us into that movement by sharing stories. Yeah, T give it, walk me through the role of faith in your household. I know uh, with Dr. King and really the entire civil rights movement, it was all predicated on faith. That it was a a religious as well as a moral, you know, drive. Give me a sense of what your father, Jackie Robinson, imparted to you. Correct. Well, first of all, my dad came from a very religious um, upbringing. His mom was deeply religious, a praying woman. I mean, they had five things they had to do in house. They had to go to school. They had to work. They had to take care of their younger siblings, and they had to, and had to do their homework. And they had to pray every day. You know, so my dad was a praying man, and f faith was very much uh, gave him the strength uh, to carry forward forward on all of his challenges in mm -hmm. life, uh, from the professional ones to the personal ones. And um, so my, what my dad said to me, because I attended Sunday school every Sunday, mm -hmm. but we, again, we went to the church in our community. So I walked to church every Sunday. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter to me at all that uh, I was in a white church. And it didn't even, I didn't really even understand that until I got to be the same teenage years when I realized mm -hmm. my black friends were going to a black church. And then mm -hmm. I went to a, a Baptist church and I was like, oh. Huh. This is different, you know, but, huh. but the church where I grew up, uh, I loved it because it was like an, in, right in nature. Mm -hmm. You know, we would go into the woods and have, um, you know, special on sunrise service. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that kind of a, a small community mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. The, the child, child of the Dream, your book so covers. Faith was, you know, but my go dad, ahead. I was just going to say, you know, uh, Raymond, faith was very important in my house and prayer was important, but my dad also said it's how you live every day, Sharon. It's not whether you go to church every Sunday, it's how you, you live and how you treat people and how you give back to others. Mm -hmm. And that was really the, the major tenet in our house. Mm -hmm. So it was faith-based, certainly, but it was also service, you know, mm -hmm. giving, giving to others. Child of the Dream, your book covers 1963 from your birthday in January through the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing in Birmingham in that September. Now, so much happens in that nine-month span. You wanted to be part of the Children's March in Birmingham, but your father wouldn't let you go. What did he propose instead? He came back from the Children's Crusade and having brought money down there and, and proposed that we, as a, that we as a family take on this mission. And the way he said we were going to do it is we're going to start doing a fundraiser at our house in Stanford, Connecticut. So, you know, we had a house with a lot of land and it was not that far from New York City. So we started having, we had our first of many jazz concerts to raise money for uh, Dr. King um, in June of 1963. And it was a family effort. So he gave each of us a role. <laughs> You know, Dave and I, and we all, the, the kids all had to clean their rooms so they have a place for the artists to change. Mm. 
and we had a, you know, David and I organized um, the other children to sell hot dogs and sodas. And my older brother helped my dad park cars and greet the guests. Wow. My mom was like, over, overall, every, she did. She was the directress. Mm. <laughs> and it was the first time we sort of had this kind of a, a family effort. Yeah. And then in August, he also told us we were going to march. We were going to go to the March on Washington, mm. and which we did as a, a in, the entire family went. And mm. that was a really unifying force for us mm. as a family. And it did allow us to feel like we were part of the larger mm -hmm. uh, civil rights movement. Um, in so that was critical to our development. Sharon, before I let you go, and the book is. And then the you know we had the second jazz concert in September. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you were to write about in the book. Before I let you go, uh, Child of the Dream it 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 captures this really pivotal moment. But when I reflect on all this, I keep thinking of Dr. King's words that he wanted children to be judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. Do you worry that that part of the message has, has been lost, if you will, or uh, somehow subverted? Yes. Well, you know, the, it, what my dad taught me is that we're, we were changing laws during the civil rights movement, you, but you can't legislate against hate. So what we had at work and the struggle was going to be an ongoing process. So, yes, um, we are still fighting for equality, dignity for all people, you know, appreciation for differences, um, and just oh, this, this equal America that, mm -hmm. that we envisioned many years ago and Dr. King talked about. We do, certainly, um, opportunity and access is, you know, always the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. Sharon Robinson, thank you so much for sharing your memories. The book is Child of the Dream, a memoir of 1963. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. A Child of the Dream, a memoir of 1963 by Sharon Robinson is available at bookstores everywhere and online. Well, he's produced hit films like Heaven is for Real. He's a best-selling author. I sat down with him recently to talk about his faith, films, and his book, The Truth About Men. Here's my exclusive interview with Devon Franklin. Tell me about Breakthrough. Now, this story, I've been hearing about this movie for, for what seems like a year. Uh, what compelled you about this story and drove you to make this film? Yeah, you know, I was promoting Miracles from Heaven um, right. just not that long ago, uh, which was a film I produced. And while I was promoting that film, I ran into the real family that Breakthrough is based on. Mm. Um, I met Joy Smith and John Smith Aww. and Pastor Jason Noble. And Aww. Joy started telling the story of how she prayed her 14-year-old son, John Smith, back to life after he died falling through a frozen lake. And when I heard her story, I knew immediately that this was a story I had to tell because it was just so inspirational. I mean, I've just never heard anything like it. Uh, the fact that her son was literally dead. The mm. doctors had done all they could do. He was without a pulse uh, for, for over an hour. Mm. And they told her to go in the emergency room to say goodbye. And she doesn't go say goodbye. She goes in there and she prays. And the moment she prayed, uh, John Smith, her son, got her, his heart beat back. Mm. And that was the beginning of a miraculous recovery. So that's why I wanted to tell it, because I think we need hope. I think we need inspiration. And mm. this true story, I believe, delivers that. Well, Chrissy Metz from uh, This Is Us, yeah. NBC's Big Drama, and Mike Coulter, who plays Luke Cage in the Marvel series. Uh, you, you've got some incredible actors in this, in this film. Yeah. Do you see more mainstream actors willing to work in this faith-centered space than you did before? You know, I think that the stigma um, sometimes that's associated with the space, the negative stigma that sometimes is associated with the space is beginning to uh, change. Mm -hmm. um, but fundamentally, I think it comes down to the project. Right. Now, I don't think that any actor signs on to a project for a genre. Mm -hmm. They're signing on to it for the story and the characters. Right. So I believe as long as we continue to, you know, develop scripts with great stories and great characters, we're going to continue to be able to attract uh, different types of actors um, to stories like this. And Breakthrough certainly is no exception. Uh, being able to have Chrissy Metz and Josh Lucas and Topher Grace, and you mm -hmm. mentioned Mike Coulter, mm -hmm. as well as Dennis Haysbert, right. Sam Trammell, Marcel Ruiz. We have an all-star, diverse cast that has come together to bring this story to light. And it has everything to do with the power of the underlying true story. Now, now, Devon, you have produced a slew of films. I mean, everything from uh, Heaven is for Real to uh, uh, Jumping the Broom, Miracles from Heaven, The Star. Do you find there's a growing market for films among this 
audience in America that perhaps is underserved? And why do you think that audience is making itself felt in this way now? You know, that's a good question, um, Raymond. I don't, I don't know exactly. Um, you know, I think, you know, not because it's, it's my film, but I think yeah. the success of Breakthrough mm -hmm. will help really answer that question. Uh -huh. You know, here's a movie that is high quality, great production values, incredible cast, you know, a lot of already, you know, excitement, anticipation. Mm -hmm. So I do believe that if Breakthrough works and people get behind this film and we literally see a breakthrough at the box office, I think it will say officially, yes, there is an audience, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people want more films like this. Last year around this time, my good friends, the Irwin brothers and mm -hmm. Kevin Downs, they released I Can Only Imagine, mm -hmm. and that film, you know, shocked and wowed Hollywood. And I do mm -hmm. believe that if Breakthrough can do something similar, it will officially say and answer your question, which is, yes, the audience is here, the audience wants more, and now, you know, all of Hollywood's going to have to take notice mm -hmm. and begin to treat this audience as a real audience with yeah. real content and real support. The last two weeks in the top ten, we saw this unplanned movie, uh, this pro-life yeah. film, Abby Johnson, about Abby Johnson's story. Um, what does that tell you? This movie did much better than Hollywood or anybody else thought it would. Were you surprised yeah. at the success of this movie? You know, I mean, I'm, I try never to be surprised with the success of, uh, you know, movies of faith because, uh, you know, I know that Hollywood can't track these films. Mm -hmm. And uh, the crazy thing is that every time a movie of faith works, just go and Google the headline. Oh, wow, a surprise hit. <laughs> Unbelievable. Un I, mean, you, I mean, literally, as long as I've been involved in making faith films, this is always the narrative. Right. So, um, no, I wasn't surprised. I know that that true story had a really strong core following mm -hmm. and a lot of people that were in the, in that pre, in the, the press around it, you yep. know, really helped motivate and propel that growth. Mm -hmm. So I'm feeling like, you know, this audience is not so much underserved, it's underrated. Ah. And I think that's why Hollywood continues to mm -hmm. uh, overlook it. Um, but again, with the success, hopefully a breakthrough, I think yep. it'll finally bring this audience to the forefront. And uh, Hollywood is going to have to take notice and, and begin to treat it like any other genre audience with yep. real movies, real support and continued, um, you know, yeah. financing to reach them. Well, Mel Gibson kind of cracked this open, what, what, 14 years ago now. And then since then, we've seen some films tap into that excitement. So I, I, Breakthrough could be the next, uh, you know, the next uh, major benchmark here of this audience making their stand and making their voices heard. I want to show you a little clip of the trailer for Breakthrough. Watch. Boys, get off the ice. We're training for the Olympics, sir. Cindy. Yeah. He's been underwater for more than 15 minutes. It's gonna be a recovery, not a rescue. I got something. I got him! We've done everything medically possible. There's nothing more we can do. No. Please, God, send your Holy Spirit to save my son. A 14-year-old St. Charles boy who spent 15 minutes trapped underwater is continuing to fight for his life. We're not gonna get through this alone. Ah! Whatever you have for me, for Brian, for John, surrender. Devon, I want to ask you about your latest book. Um, it just yes. came out recently, The Truth About Men. And in it, you write about Training the dog, also known as the lust problem. <laughs> what do you mean by training the dog? Um, yeah, you know, well, it's all about mastery, you know, right. and I believe that every man, uh, we have love and lust in us. Mm -hmm. And for us to be the men we were called to be, the men that God wants us to be, we have to learn how to lead in love. Uh, but that's very hard for us because we weren't taught to love ourselves. Uh, and it's very hard to give love um, when we don't know how to receive love. And so I talk about, you know, in the book, I use this analogy. So love is called the master. Lust is called the dog. I believe that lust is the thing that, ta that really impacts 
that it uh, impacts most men in a negative way. Mm -hmm. So for us to get control, discipline, uh, for us to become men of integrity and character, we have to master the dog within. We've got to put love in control of lust. We have to put selflessness over selfishness. And this is when we can really become the men God created us to be. Mm -hmm. And I wrote this book as a manual on how to do it. Too often, um, you know, within communities of faith, mm -hmm. we suppress, we don't discuss. Mm -hmm. And I believe that anything we suppress, we empower to destroy us. Mm -hmm. And it's time to start being truthful, transparent, and honest about our struggles so that we can get victory over them mm -hmm. and no longer suffer in silence. And I believe this book will help not only just men, but women as well, because women don't have enough information about us. They don't know what's really going on with the men they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So this book will give women information as well as, as propelling men to become the men we were created to be mm -hmm. and giving us the roadmap on how to do it. Uh, Devon, this is a very personal book to you, too. I mean, yeah. I, you, you're right. Your father cheated on your mom. Uh, and, yeah. and I know that had to be difficult. How did that change or shape the man you wanted to be and would become? That knowledge. Oh, it, I mean, it, yeah, it changed. Uh, well, it shaped it. I wouldn't say changed because mm -hmm. I found it so I found out so early yeah. um, that I don't know that I had yet a point of view about the man I wanted to be when I mm -hmm. discovered mm -hmm. that my father had cheated on my mother. But what it did as I grew into, uh, you know, adulthood out of adolescence mm -hmm. and into manhood, it definitely shaped uh, the man I wanted to be because finding out that my father, before he passed away, cheated on my mother, you know, was devastating. Mm -hmm. And I began mm -hmm. to ask the question, can men be faithful? Do all men cheat? Why is it so hard for sometimes to, for us to stay committed and see that commitment all the way through? And so the shaping of my uh, adulthood and manhood really helped me, you know, navigate that question and pursue an answer to that question. And part of the being transparent was to admit these things about myself, uh, about my family, mm -hmm. uh, as a way to help other men and women as they read the book know that we're all in this together. Yeah. There's too much finger pointing. There's too much judgment. We got to get back to the place of love and mm -hmm. empathy and understanding. We can never become who God wants us to be as men and women if we keep judging each other, if we keep talking at one another. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find that when we're truthful and we do it in love, that's when we can begin the process of not only healing, mm -hmm. but actually transformation. So it all started with me being transparent. Final question. How do you want Breakthrough to be received by audiences and why should they come? Yeah. You know, I want Breakthrough to be received by audiences, uh, you know, in the spirit in which it was made. Mm -hmm. uh, this movie truly puts on display the real superhero. I know everybody loves mm -hmm. uh, all these Marvel films, and hey, I like them too, but let's be honest, those are all make-believe and made up. Right. Uh, I can tell you they're made in computers and they're made on, on green screen, <laughs> but Breakthrough puts on display a real superhero, a praying mother, mm -hmm. and she displays the real superpower, which is prayer. So I want everybody to watch Breakthrough and come out of the theater inspired and excited. Uh, whether or not all your prayers have been answered, it doesn't take away the fact that God still is in the prayer answering business, mm -hmm. that he still is in the miracle working business. And I believe breakthrough confirms that. So my hope is people come out of the theater and that they have that revelation and that they're also reminded that the underlying message is love. Love absolutely wins. Um, the love of God, the love of each other. Going back to even the question we were just talking about, mm -hmm. uh, too often we have differences and we let those differences become barriers to community mm -hmm. and barriers to unity. Breakthrough mm -hmm. says, even though I may not agree with you, I'm going to still pray with you. I'm still going to pray for you. Mm -hmm. I'm still going to pray that God's blessings be upon you. What would happen if we came out of the theater and we said, yeah, I may have a difference of opinion on a wide variety of things, mm -hmm. but you're still God's child. I still want to be there with you. I still want to pray with you. My hope is that Breakthrough will inspire that kind of mm -hmm. unity. And I, I've already been screening this movie all around the country. Yeah. You're going to have to bring your Kleenex and your popcorn because this movie <laughs> is going to it's going to blow you away. It's going to make you cry happy tears of joy. And I'm hoping that people walk out of the theater holding their, their loved one, hugging their friends, and letting them know that God loves them and that they would mm -hmm. feel loved too. And this comes out Wednesday, April 17th, just in time for Easter. Wow. And I'm praying for a breakthrough at the box office this Easter season. Yeah, I think it's coming. Yeah, we need that. Oh, we need amen. that. No, I, I, yes, we how do. How often do we leave theaters either confused, offended, or angry? We need another emotion when we march out of the Cineplex. This sounds like a great one. Devon Franklin, amen. thank you for being here. My brother, thank you as always we'll for having me. talk to you me. soon. The Truth About Men by Devon Franklin is available at bookstores everywhere. Now, that's all the time we have, but join us next week. The show continues on Facebook and Twitter. You can like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Be sure to join us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, 
Thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.